Hey, this is Brandon Crawford from the San Francisco Giants, and you're listening to TortureCast. You're listening to a podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. With hosts Willie Dills, Chad King, Ben Lee, and Eric Nathanson. Dedicated to the greatest team in Major League Baseball, the San Francisco Giants. This is Torture Cast. It's Tuesday, September 3rd, 2019, and this is episode 178 of the TortureCast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. I'm your host, Chad King, and should we just quit right now, Eric? I mean, why should we even continue? You got a hurricane coming your way. The Giants stink. You know, what is life? (laughs) Let's let's just shut it down. If nothing's mattering anymore, let's just shut it down. No, I, we kid. I kid everyone. Uh, we, we we love the Giants. They just had they had a rough week, um, but we were talking about last week, and they were four games back in the second wild card. They had lost a half a game in the standings from the previous week, and we were saying, God, you know, this is pretty much it. They got a two or three percent chance. They're losing time. Well, you know what? I mean, they truly did take the horse out back and shoot it. There's no doubt now in anyone's mind that the Giants are not making the postseason. And uh, it's really sad, but at the same time, it definitely ripped the Band-Aid off quite quickly. Yeah, it did. It went from on the fringe to completely out of the race. This is where if we were a professional podcast, the sound drop of the funeral march would come in because that's kind of what the Giants are on. They're they're entering September now, and they're, what is it, 66 and 71, eight full games back of the second wild card, four games in the standings since last Monday. So that's just... That's that's bad enough if it happens in April, but to happen right as you're entering September, the Giants got not hot at the worst time, and yeah. uh, they 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 laid a goose egg of a homestand. They they were only able to win one of six games at home against the Diamondbacks and Padres, and they've lost ten of their last thirteen. This is not the same team that we watched in June and July. No, it's 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 quite concerning. I actually almost opened up the podcast with a funeral march. Now that you say that, that's kind of funny. <laughs> You're thinking on the same term there, but I figured, all right, I'm going to pump the brakes on that a little bit. Um, the reality is they lost four games in the standings, but if you look at the record of one and six oh, since we recorded, we're recording a day late because of Labor Day. Um, look, they went one and six, and they lost four games. So that means if you do the math, if they went five and two, they would still be four games back in the wild card. Yeah. And that's what's distressing about it. And maybe that will give you a little bit of comfort in this, in the fact that even if they had a really good week at 5-2, and two, or hell, even 6-1, and one, they still would have been three or four games back in the wild card with 25 to play and three or four teams ahead of them. So in reality, it probably doesn't change the ultimate outcome of not making the playoffs. But you want to see fight in this team. You want to see them finish above 500 you want to see them at least go down to the last week with a chance and they just dispelled all illusions of that happening and it's quite depressing but like you said one in five on the homestand and and we they continue to struggle at home and i don't know if it is psychological or what or maybe the seagulls bug them i i don't know what it is but they just can't seem to produce at home and it really was telling this Week and the only win, of course, came via a stellar performance by Madison Bumgarner. Other than that, you really didn't have very good performances by most of the team this week at all. Which that's like duh, but still, yeah, it was. It wasn't memorable. It was one of those weeks that we watched in April or May that it was just kind of like, okay, the Giants can't score; they're going to lose. They're thirty and thirty-eight at home, and they've scored two hundred and thirty-five runs. They've they're thirty-six and thirty-three on the road. Obviously, better. Uh, in one more game, they've scored 365 runs. So they've scored 130 more runs on the road than they have at home. And like you said, I don't know if it's mental or or what it is. I don't know what accounts for it. But uh, it was every time they seemed to fall behind a little bit over the past week, it just felt like it was inevitable that the Giants were going to go down, that they didn't have enough punch 
to necessarily do it. And it, it, it's a shame seeing as they're they're winding down and they started this month of thanking Bochi. They brought back like uh, Greg Vaughn and Trevor Hoffman over the weekend to see him and they unveiled this thing on the wall and it's supposed to be like his swan song. So you hope they'll be a little more competitive than they have over the last week. Yeah. But uh, this last week probably put uh, finishing at 500 in jeopardy at the uh, at the very least. Now now the goal really is just to get Bochi to uh, 2,000 wins. Yeah, being five games under 500 with with uh, 25 to go, they have to go on a little bit of a hot streak to try and finish at or above 500. Like you said, I think the goal is to get Bochi to 2,000. Uh, it's still, of course, well within reach, but those percentages are dwindling to a certain extent. Um, they won one they won one game this week, Eric, and so they still need eight more wins. Now, with 25 to go, you do the math, that means they need to go 8 and 17. That's less than 333 ball, okay? If anyone can do this, you know, even the Ray, no, not the Rays, the Orioles could probably do this, but you never know. Last month or last year in September, they won five games. So yeah. if they repeated that performance, they're not going to reach it. I don't think they will because that was a really historically bad month, one of the worst ever in history. But that said, they still have to win eight games this month, and they need to start now to, <laughs> to dispel any um, you know, doubt, I guess, in Giants fans' minds. And, and the players want to do it for Bochi. There's no question about that. And I don't think they're feeling too much pressure at this point, but at the same time, I'm sure it's in the back of their minds. Yeah, they they got to be thinking about it, and they have to know in that clubhouse that they've kind of fallen out of it. Um, when ceremonial things become the forefront of your focus, that that's when you kind of know that you've fallen out of it. And there are players in that clubhouse like Posey and Bumgarner and Crawford and Belt who have been with Boach a long time that you know are going to work their ass off to to do what they can for him. Pablo would have fallen in that range if he wasn't injured. And then you you got to figure the young guys like Yastrzemski who got his first chance under uh, Bochy. Uh, Dickerson, who's got an extended playing time under him. You know, Pilar, who's having his best offensive season. You know, those guys will also try to step it up for them. It's just they they have a rough uh, road to hoe. I mean, on, on the road, they are in St. Louis now for three more. Then they go to L.A. for three. And then in a couple of weeks, they travel to Atlanta and Boston. So they're, every team they're facing on the road the rest of the way is a winning team. They're going to have to get fat against Pittsburgh and Miami. Uh a week from now at home and then maybe against the Rockies before they finish the season against the Dodgers in that last week of September because the Giants do not have an easy schedule. And that was always the thought of, of them being in the race, that they had to be really close to hang in it because their schedule is so tough. And now, I mean, you have it here, 8-17, and 17, they need to go in 25 games to get Bochy to 2,000. And while I don't think they'll only win five games, you're right. One win a week's not going to get it done. That's that's four wins. We have four weeks of baseball left. <laughs> they need to do a little better than that. Two, and two four. wins a week. That's all they need to do is go two and four. And this uh, this farewell tour of Bochy will feel like it's completely rounded out and, and complete. You know, and and talking about that, I, I mentioned it here the thank you Boach they unveiled on the wall on Sunday during the game and they said they're going to do a month long thing so that means people like Matt Kane are going to return to the ballpark maybe Vogel song you know guys like that I bet start coming around during the month as they honor Bochi and it makes you wonder if Tim Lincecum's going to show up oh wouldn't that be something with yep, his new highlights <laughs> he really <laughs> yeah it was a few weeks ago someone spotted him at a restaurant and took a picture with him and he had uh, frosted tips Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Timmy, we lived through the 90s. You, you don't have to do that. I, I know. <laughs> but imagine the ovation he would get out of all of the Giants players. We we all figure he would get the biggest one, and I think he would. And he, he feels like, you know, one of Bochy's kids, much like the guys I mentioned earlier. So, you know, they need to, they need to do better than this one win a week to win these eight games for Bochy. And I, I'm sure that that's what they're all pulling on in the clubhouse. So you noted here that Kevin Pillar hit his 20th home run of the year, of course, over the weekend, and he's the first to do so as a Giant since Brandon Crawford in 2015. Ironically, he didn't even start the season with the Giants. Um, it's interesting because you have a, a series of stats that you were telling me pre-show, but he really has had his career year, at least in terms of high water mark for home runs. With the Giants, which is really ironic. He's never been known as a home run hitter with Toronto, and he still isn't known as a home run hitter. But hitting 20 at Oracle with the Giants is, it's like hitting 30 or 40 somewhere else. So 
Uh, I have a theory about this, and I'll let you get to your stats here in a second. Yeah. The Giants haven't had a, a 20 home run hitter, like we mentioned, since Brandon Crawford in 2015. And you have some other stats to, to back that up, which are really interesting. But why do the Giants struggle so much? Well, okay, the park, Triples Alley. They're talking about, in fact, a lot of brass players, broadcasters, whatever, have let it slip over the last couple of months that when they close off Triples Alley next year, when they adjust the dimensions, it seems like there's something known, perhaps, by some people that the public doesn't know. But I think it's almost a guarantee they're going to adjust the dimensions next year. I, of course, the park has something to do with it. The reality is... The opposing hitters that come in have not seen a as significant of a decline in home run production that the Giants do. Now, why is that? A lot of people attribute it to psychological effect. The players, especially ones that have been here for a long time, including the veterans, or even guys that have been here for two or three years, it gets in their heads. They see it day to day at home, and once it kind of snowballs maybe there's no way of stopping thinking about not hitting a home run or you can't hit a home run at oracle that's just an assumption of mine but it's been shared by some writers and even some broadcasters about it mike crook and kipe absolutely agree that the home run issue is a psychological issue in their heads and these are you know respected baseball guys kevin pilar comes over you know a couple weeks into the season and yes he's heard of it yes he knows about it but he's like, whatever, I'm not a home run hitter. He comes in and he does his job. I wonder if this year he's a little bit, in a way, immune to that psychological effect because he doesn't have that hangover like a lot of the other players do. And maybe he has a kind of a cons more consistent approach at the plate. And maybe there's no deficit of thinking of that. And you think about like the same with Yaz. Um, he's new and he's hit 18 home runs this year as well. So... I know you have Belt and, and who has it, what, 16 or 17, and Pablo, and, and those guys have been around for a while, but they're still not at 20. Pablo won't hit 20. And I'm just wondering if, if you think there's any credence to that theory. Well, it's not a bad thought because you tie in that not only um, is Pilar – knew he didn't hear all spring training or he didn't get questions from the writers yeah. all like off season like Alongo did when he got traded uh to the giants you know didn't get the how are you going to hit in the new ballpark when it's not hitter friendly because like Longo as an example only has four homers at home this year and he's at 18 right now so i, I even asked Longo about that two years ago that's uh, all i could think yeah. <laughs> yeah, I literally asked him about hitting home runs in this park. And I mean, I know a lot of other people asked him. That's a really good point you bring up. Right. And so the, that you you talk about the psychological part of it. You know, Pilar, he got dropped into the team. He didn't spend spring training with the team. There was no, you know, beat writer questions leading up to it. He didn't have to sit through, you know, 40 days of spring training before the season started when everybody's trying to make stories. Yaz is the same way. He came over late at the end of spring training. So he, he basically just came over and broke camp. So these are not guys that were subjected to constant stories of the horrors of like a Brandon Belt. And I, I don't know if Belt's out there talking about how he's tired of hitting the ball 400 feet and it getting caught. Yeah. But uh, that that you know I, I could absolutely see credence to to that as being part of it. Uh, I also think with Pilar though his at first he swings at everything and and it's been frustrating at times. Less mm -hmm. frustrating lately because he's been productive. Um, so I also think the law of averages are just coming into him and he's connecting on a few more. And plus he has that right, um, right-handed pull stroke, uh, even his 20th, it almost hit the ambulance the other day. Uh, he, he tends to pull the ball to left field a lot more than just a lot of the other right-handed hitters that the giants have had power wise. You know, you think about guys that we get frustrated with belts, uh, Crawford to an extent, you know, every guy that we talk about that should be a big home run hitter at Oracle is always a lefty. And here Pilar is just doing it by yanking balls in the left field seats. I mean, he's not hitting them deep. They're going five, 10 rows up and that's all he needs. Yeah. So I, I think there's definitely credence to the fact that there was, you know, there's really no psychological hex over those kind of guys as there is <laughs> over guys like 
Belt and Crawford and Posey because Posey does have that right center field swing uh, of guys who have constantly hit the ball 400 feet and they've gone to be outs. So I think that that has something to do with it. And I think next year when they do move stuff, uh, I think we'll, we're going to see uh, kind of like an, oh, like Posey's going to be like, oh, wait a second. I can hit a home run to right center field now right. instead of, you know, what's the point of doing, you know, hitting the ball? Because you can see it in his body language when he hits a fly ball to right center field in a home game. Like he immediately drops his shoulders like, damn it, I can't hit it there. You know, it's so, crazy. I, I just I, I do. His... I think the psychological is part of it. I just Googled his spray chart. And mm-hmm. I'm looking at all the home runs. Not one, not one home run has been hit to dead center field or to the right. Not one. Yeah. Every single one is to left field. There's one to almost center field. It's a little left of center. The rest of them, all the other 19, are literally left center and left, including five literally down the line. Yeah, he's almost hit that got, ambulance a couple times, yeah. Yeah, so that's a really interesting point that you bring up because if you yank it, and he is a yanker, he screws in. Yes. Right? That back foot screws in. He really gets ahead of that ball when he hits home runs. So that's a prototypical diagnostic I never really thought about. He does not you spray know, the ball in terms of his power. You know who's kind of like that? I think we saw it yesterday, Doobie. Uh, when Dubon hit mm-hmm. his first home run, it was a very similar type home run. He yanked it down the, the left field line. I think yeah. we could see him uh, benefit from uh, hooking some balls down the line at Oracle because it seems to play short there if you can hit the ball hard enough. Wow, that's crazy. I've never looked at the spray charts before. It's quite telling. <laughs> yeah, he hooks it. He. I mean, that's why I hate it when I get frustrated. Polar, I get most frustrated with – when he swings at pitches that are out of the zone, off the plate, you know, away from him, because he can't do anything with them because he hooks everything. Yeah. Um, when he hits a base hit to right center field, it's an accident. He's really shooting for up the middle and the left side of the field. And he's just a little behind it or something like that. Yeah. Right, so you right, had absolutely. some interesting stats, uh, not just Crawford 2015, but you had some interesting stats in terms of 20 and 30 home run hitters. Well, I last year I think it was last year we were amazed that there was 117 20 home run hitters in baseball and the Giants didn't have any of them. Uh, I think there's already more than that this year. Thankfully, Kevin Pillar just hit his 20th home run on Sunday. But going back 2004, when Barry Bonds hit 45 home runs, it's the last time any Giants batter has hit over 30 in a season. No Giants player has hit even over 30 home runs in a season since 2004. Uh, Bonds' final season, uh, he hit 28, and that is still the high watermark for home run leaders under Bruce Bochy. Under Bochy, nobody's hit more than 28 home runs. Nobody's hit more than 27 pence in 2013. Uh, I mean, last year it was Longo with 16, and Gorky's and Kutch tied with 15. I mean, can you believe that? Gorky's hit the second most home runs on the team last year. Uh, and then you got Belt leading the team a couple years, 18, 17. You have to go back to Posey with 22 homers in his in 2014 uh, uh, before Craw. I mean, they just don't have a lot of 20 home run hitters. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 now seasons of 20 home run hitters under 14 under Bruce Bochy, which is just crazy to think because they won a championship in 2014. Posey led the way with 22. 2012, Posey wow. led the way with 24. 2010, Huff led the way with 26. So the Minnesota Twins just set the all-time record for home runs in a season over the weekend at 269, and they have 25, 26 games left in the season. I mean, it, that's just incredible. If you look at the list of team home runs, and by the way, I don't have the current total of 20 home run hitters, but I think it's like, yeah, it's like 130 or 140 with like a month to go in the season, which is like going to be a total record and the Giants have contributed one player to that but the Twins have 269 home runs this year they've already set the record last year the Yankees set the record that the Twins just broke at 267 before that it was the 97 Mariners 2005 Rangers 96 Orioles 10 Jays 19 Yankees still have 256 16 Orioles 2000 Astros 2001 Rangers 96 Mariners 12 Yankees 19 Dodgers current 245 99 Mariners the point I'm making here is that everything's been recent, and the fact that Barry Bonds hit 28 home runs in his final season in 2007, and everybody was clamoring, like, dude, the guy can still play. <laughs> Obviously, 
He wasn't re-signed by anyone because of the stigma. We all know this. But to think of what he could have hit in 2008, probably more than 20 for the Giants, <laughs> I would I would imagine, right? In um, 2008, and, Benji Molina led the way with 16. Oh, geez. And to think that it wasn't the dead ball era by any stretch of the imagination, but after the home run barrage with steroids, there was rumors that the ball tightened up. Um, and if it did or didn't, it definitely is not as lucid as it, as it is now. If you put Barry Bonds, even at age you know, 39, 40, on this team right now, he would easily have 30 home runs right now. Don't you agree? Oh, my God. At least. I at think least. he'd be up in the 50s. I think he'd be hooking the ball into the cove left and right. I mean, he's the one guy that could do that. Plus, he could also go the opposite way. Oh, my God. Uh, if they were using the baseball now during Bonds' record-setting year, he could have hit oh. like 80. It might have been 80. I, I yeah, mean, I mean yeah. right right now the American League uh, – actually, let me go to MLB here. Um, here are all the, the guys. There are 20, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 33 players that have 30 home runs or more. We have a month to go, 33 players. So by law of averages, the Giants should have one, right? No, not even close. They have – you know. <laughs> Let's Ten see where Kevin Pillar is like off the list right now, but obviously you have Bellinger at 44, Trout at 43, Yelich at 43, and it goes down from there. But you just like go, what the hell is it about this team? Because some of these players in these other parks that still are somewhat hard to hit home runs in are still hitting them. And it just, it just doesn't make sense. But the Giants are going to be afflicted by this, you know, for a long time. And if they do bring in the fences next year in Triples Alley, great. That will increase the Giants' home runs. But how many more visitor home runs are going to be hit? That's the real question. Is it going to be a help? Yeah. Psychologically, it may be. Maybe it's a good thing to do in, in terms of attracting a free agent hitter. And I think that's probably the prime value of it. But as far as like a day-to-day -day ball game kind of thing, they're not going to outslug the visitors at this point. Not until they reconstruct this team the way it is. So it, it could actually be an ultimate, you know, change in in terms of number of losses every year at least for the foreseeable future well i mean with such a dichotomy between home and away though the giants have always been a team that were built for their ballpark and since the game has changed they are now having to change with it and i think zaidi has shown us signs that he is doing just that and, and it's funny i uh, i'm gonna skip down real quick because uh, we talk about how they're not playing well at home, and Giants fans talk about it, just the overall vibe in the ballpark. It's not like during the championship years or even most of the Bochi years where you felt like the Giants had an advantage where they could go out and win. And, and it seems like, like it filters to the fans because attendance is down this season. Um, we're going to talk about Pablo, and Sunday he got an ovation, but like I agree, Baggerly tweeted out right away. I agree yeah. with everybody. That should have been a scream your head up off till he comes back out from the dugout and acknowledges you again type moment and it really really wasn't uh and it seems like the whole vibe at oracle park is just dead this year and you wonder if moving the fences will help that because like attendance is suffering and i say suffering with quotation marks but uh, they're only averaging thirty three thousand five hundred fifty a game this year Last year it was 38,000, and last year wasn't that good of a, a team. You know, this is going to be – actually, I thought it would be the first time, but this could be the third time since they've moved into this ballpark that they'll draw under $3 million. Uh, They did below it uh, when Bonds left the team in 08 and 09 and then got oh. back over $3 million in 2010. But like last year, they drew three point one million, and this year they're they're only on pace to draw two point seven million at home. And and I have to wonder if you know five thousand fans less a game. You look at this weekend, um, or just this past homestand, they had three games against uh, two games against Arizona that drew twenty nine thousand and twenty eight thousand. A year ago, those same games drew thirty eight and thirty seven thousand mm -hmm. for Monday and Tuesday games against Arizona. So, you know, there's definitely less people coming to the park. There's less of a home field advantage overall for the Giants. And so maybe by switching around and bringing Triples Alley in and, and cutting that off, maybe maybe it'll become a home field advantage. Maybe in some way, shape, or form, they'll turn into that slugging team. Maybe that's the direction Farhan's going because when the fans aren't feeling it either, 
you, you know the front office is feeling that crunch, uh, especially after deciding not to trade certain guys because they want to hang on to them for entertainment value. And guys like Bumgarner came through this week, you know, because he was the only one that delivered a win. So, I mean, I think just the overall vibe at the ballpark is different. You know, fans just aren't seeing the same product and they're frustrated and they know it's Bochy's last season. So I'm, I'm very curious to see if the Giants can draw well next year if they're still in this rebuild mode because uh, there doesn't seem to be a home decisive home field advantage for them anymore. Not at all. All right. So there was a lot of brouhaha a few weeks ago or at the trade deadline or just I guess not the trade deadline a little after that. Um, Joe Panic was released. And, you know, of course, he was picked up by the Mets, and he's doing well with them. And that's great. We're, we're all Joe Panic fans. They picked up Scooter Jeanette for a little trade in, in cash, and we thought, oh, okay, well, this is pretty good pickup. He's got power. He's had some groin injury, but, you know, uh, maybe that it'll work out for the Giants. And he's had a couple home runs with them, but overall he's not performed very well for the Giants, and Zaidi had no um, issue with pulling the trigger early. Yeah, and that was quick. It, it was a little quicker than I thought. I, I honestly thought that Zaidi was going to let him play out for the season. The only reason I say that is because by the time he released him, the Giants were pretty much, for all intents and purposes, out of the race before this la- latest um, you know, losing streak. Of course, Jeanette or his replacement would have made no difference and didn't make any difference. So I was a little shocked by this, but the Giants DFA'd their... Their their trade you know uh, uh, jewel here, uh, they DFA'd Scooter and promoted uh, Dubon, who they got from uh, Milwaukee, in the Pomerantz trade, which was great. That was a great trade, and so far Dubon looks you know pretty darn good. He's not a power hitter though, like Jeanette, but he might be your more prototypical second baseman slash shortstop. But um, it's 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 just uh, you know for Giants fans, it's a little shocking and jarring to see this kind of movement happen so quickly it's one thing when it's with guys you don't know very well that are just shuttled in and out you're like okay 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 whatever but then you get rid of you know a a mainstay not an icon but a mainstay like joe panic for Jeanette, and then Jeanette goes a few weeks later and they promote dubon which we don't know that you know the jury's still out on how he's going to be but it's just uh, – it's, it's a new regime, Eric, and so I think we still have to adjust our, our baseline to see how he's going to run this team. Well, I, personally, um, I, I, I was actually more happy uh, than shocked to see uh, – it was quick to see Zaidi cut ties with Scooter so, so fast, but uh, I, I was just happy to see that he was willing to move on. Uh, it was the Dubon trade. Uh, originally that that broke first about an hour and a half before the trade deadline and i remember that day when they made the trade for dubon i said that was the end of joe panic in yeah. san francisco Me too. and then they made and then they made the trade for scooter so it was kind of like understanding that they were getting his replacement and that when they decided to call dubon up scooter was going to be done i didn't think he'd be dfa i thought he'd be thrown on the bench but it made it sense to DFA him because you still want Donovan Solano as your backup middle infielder behind Dubon and Crawford. And Dubon has shown versatility. He can play both second and shortstop and play them well, I might add. He's got really good footwork. He's got really good hands. He's got really good hands. They're very quick. They're Javi Baez-like. Very uh, quick. I've noticed yeah. the same thing. He looks like a kid. He looks like he does not yeah, he look does. like a baseball player, does he? I mean, no, he, he looks like a kid across the street. Seriously. Yeah, he's like some high school like sophomore who's out there. Yeah. Not even like some senior, some sophomore. His his <laughs> uniform is baggy on him. It's it's great. I love this kid. Doobie is my new favorite giant. I, no, I, I love, love him. Too. He and and he showed that he's got versatility to cover that kind of stuff. So there's no reason to get rid of Solano. He's having a great year. So cut ties with Jeanette. You know, good luck. Maybe you can catch on somewhere with one of the contenders down the stretch. You know, I think that that was part of the reasoning that they did it before the end of August because to be on a postseason roster, you have to be in an organization before September 1st. Yeah. So they were giving Scooter the chance to catch on somewhere. So I, I was just happy to see that he pulled the trigger. But it is the shining of example of how different things are being run right now because, you know, Joe 
really just got got lost in the shuffle. Panic did. He really did. It's just a shame that as a mainstay, that's how it had to happen. But if he's a second baseman that had only been here a year and a half and wasn't performing, we would have been like, all right, yeah, that's cool. It makes sense. Good luck in New York. It's just that he was around for 2014, that he makes him such a pull on the heartstring guy. So it was weird to see them do the stopgap with Jeanette. But I think it's going to turn out fine. I love watching Doobie play. No, he's 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 a lot of fun to watch. And so this is God, it makes me feel old, Eric. It should make you feel old. It should make all of you feel old. He talked about how, you know, he was from the the Caribbean. I can't remember which island or whatever, Dominican Republic. He's from uh Honduras. Honduras, okay. So he came to the United States when he was young, uh, to the Bay Area. And he grew up going to Giants games. Okay, that's fine. We've seen that before. Brandon Crawford at Candlestick with that iconic picture of him saying, don't leave, you know, for Tampa Bay, that kind of thing. He grew up as a teenager watching Brandon Belt, Brandon Crawford, (laughs) and and Buster Posey and Madison Bumgarner. And he idolized them. And he told his mom, his foster mom, that he will play here one day. And here he is, and he was talking about how it was so surreal being at second base and turning double plays with Brandon Crawford and having Brandon Bell on his right or his left and Crawford on his right. I mean, this is weird, Eric. I mean, like, these are not old guys, and here's a guy who came up idolizing the guys he's turning double plays with. It's so bizarre, but in a way, really, really cool because, you know, all of us had that dream as a kid that I'm going to play in the major leagues and I would love to play for the giants with, you know, Will Clark or, or whatever. And it's just, it's so cool to see that. I just, I just, I just love it. I just love it. I love the kid. Like you said, he's not gonna have a lot of power. That's not what he's, he's all about. He hit his first major league home run the other day or yesterday against St. Louis, but he's quick. He's quick. He's got good defense. So I think uh, there might be something there. Yeah, like I'm smiling the most that I've smiled this entire podcast just talking about Doobie. And that's partly because his smile is infectious. I, and apparently Doobie is his nickname. I uh, I tried to get Doobie. it going on Twitter over the weekend. Yeah, I just totally tried to get it going. And then it came out that Bochi, when Doobie got called up, uh, he came, he poked his head around the corner into Bochi's office and Bochi called him in. And, and uh, he, you know, they talked for a minute. Do you need anything? You're getting settled, all that stuff. And he's like... You know, so I hear, uh, what's this nickname I hear you got? And he said, well, it's it's Doobie. He's like, it really is D-U-B-I, but it's it's said like <laughs> Doobie. Yeah. And Bochy D-O-O-B-I-E, made a crack. D-O-O-B-I-E, yeah. <laughs> right, and that's how I'd been typing it, and I'm still typing it. And uh, Bochy made a crack. Well, that'll probably be a popular name in this town. And, yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. And so I was trying to get Doobie over the weekend going, and then that came out. And, and then when he hit his home run, you could hear them chanting, Doobie, 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 Doobie when he got back Doobie, to the yeah. dugout. Yep. So Doobie, Doobie is going to be his nickname. There was a there was a moment yesterday where um, Crawford caught a pop up, but they both kind of converged, and then he backed off a little bit, and Crawford caught the pop up, and then almost fired the ball right at him, and Doobie just started laughing and smiling because Crawford fired it at him, kind of like stay out of my space, man. Yeah. But it was it was like it was a hazing, like fun hazing way that he was doing it. Like he seems to be getting along with him in the middle infield. I love uh, it. He, yeah. it, it. He's We've had so many shots with like Arroyo and different things of guys we thought were going to come up and be something. And and this Doobie, he's going to be the gem that came out of this trade deadline for Zaidi. And, you know, Joe Panic got in the periphery of it. But, I mean, we're going to, I think Doobie's going to be a giant for a while. And to have him playing with his quote unquote idols is weird because it was just yesterday that Brandon Crawford. Brandon Crawford just hit a grand slam in Milwaukee for his first major league hit. It just happened. Eight years ago. Holy Eight years crap. ago, I know. Well, that's the thing. He's so young that as a teenager, you could see how he was like watching Giants games here. But that's just, you know, he's he's following Brandon Crawford's footsteps. And I think that's just really, really so cool. So let's talk about the weekend review. Um, look, we're going to breeze through this. <laughs> yeah. Very few highlights. There's no reason to stall on any of these games. But. Last Monday, they had a two-game series with Arizona. They lost 6-4 to four, and then 3-2, to two, one of their rare one-game or one-run losses. Thursday, they had an off-day Wednesday. Thursday, they lost 5-3 to three to San Diego. Friday, 
they actually beat San Diego eight to three. Mm-hmm. Bum had the I know their only win this week. That's why we're stalling here. Uh, mm-hmm. With the win, seven innings pitched, four hits, one earned run. Belt went three for five, three RBIs with a home run and a double. Yaz hit his 18th home run. So we have uh, oh, and my computer decided to crap the bed. <laughs> Uh, so I guess I won't have highlights for you. Yeah, oh, can... my Mac is saying, "Aw oh, snap, that ain't gonna happen, oh. yo." Off the top of my head, I, I think Yaz hit an opposite field home run. Um, I think Belt hit one in the water. I no, think he did. He hit, he hit well, yeah, he hit a deep one, and that's one of the the the, the, home, the highlights I have right here, which will be coming up in about one second. Here we go. Bell hits a drive to right. Hit well. It is out of here. Not in the water. And a nice start for the Giants. It's 2 nothing. All right, so that was Belt's home run. Um, geez, I just can't believe it. right. Cool. Hit well. It is out of here. <laughs> this is the same home run. My computer yeah, is. It like hit that back wall. Stuff. That's what it hit. It That's did. right. It hit that back wall. It did. So anyway, they uh, they won. I won't play Yaz's home run, but he hit the opposite field. John Miller called it, and he wasn't so sure that it was going to go out. Uh, that was their only one of the week. And then Saturday, yeah. they lost four to one to San Diego. But that was Logan Webb's first home start, and he did pretty well. Uh, but Tony Watson took the loss with uh, giving up a run in the eighth in a tie game. It was one to one at the time. And then Will Smith gave up a two-run bomb in the ninth to make it four to one. Sunday they lost eight to four to San Diego. This was the last game that Bruce Bochy will ever manage against the Padres, and of course, you know that it's significant because of his history with the Padres, and it was also significant in the sense that the Giants needed to win that game to split the series, and they did not. However, Pablo Sandoval was activated off of the IL to get his long-awaited last at bat potentially well certainly with Bochi, but potentially yeah. with the giants and even potentially in his major league career we just don't know what's going to happen with him after his tommy john surgery that he's going to have this week um so anyway i have that video that is also completely crap the bed as well <laughs> so thank you my computer we're just going to go ahead and skip that in essence of it wasn't that exciting. It was a ground out. So what are you going to do? It was. Um, but it was a productive out. He could have grounded into a double play. That's true. But he hit it soft <laughs> enough. It was nice of him. He hit it soft enough. So it was just a productive out, and he moved the runner from first to second. I don't think that runner came around to score. Maybe he did. No. I, I honestly not. can't remember. Okay. So <laughs> one of the weird things I thought about that, and I don't have the audio of that, of course, because my computer is not working, but um, Rennell announced him, yeah. and – it was weird. Like I was watching, so I was painting this wall. I was painting the ship lap I put in for our house this week, and I watched that live. And I was really disappointed, not only in the announcement because I wish I could play it for you, but she said, "And now batting, Panda." Yeah. And that was it. It wasn't. And now batting for your San Francisco Giants, number forty-eight. Pablo Sandoval, you know, it wasn't like this whole buildup. It was just like, and now betting the panda. And it was just like anticlimactic. So he got a good, you know, decent ovation. He grounded out and he got an ovation. And then they played a montage of his highlights with the Giants in between innings. And it was completely crucified by Andrew Baggerly and others. Like there was like a golf clap for him. And it was kind of sad. I know he t- he said in his post game comments that he appreciated the standing ovation and the applause, and maybe he was being nice. Maybe he heard things that he thought, you know, oh yeah, they're definitely applauding for me, and it was great. I don't know, but it just didn't seem a fitting end to his career with the Giants. It really didn't. Uh, I, I don't know if everything happened so fast, so fans had to really, you know, quickly shift into gears and then, you know, I guess shift out of them. But uh, watching the broadcast, it looked like he went into the clubhouse before they even played that thing on the video board. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's like I said earlier, they should have been cheering after he, you know, grounded out and was jogging slowly back to the dugout. They should have been cheering standing and then still standing until he came back out and waved one more time. And that didn't seem to happen. It no. just, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's the general team. I don't know if it's a different kind of fan. Um, I, I, I really, it's tough to put your finger on. Like I said, attendance is down, but it was a very full crowd yesterday, uh, Sunday yeah. for a Sunday afternoon game. So that's, that's not it at all. So, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe the fans just didn't recognize the moment for what it was. And, you know, I don't want to say there should have been more pomp and circumstance around it, but, uh, you know, maybe Rennell set the tone a little bit with that stupid, the Panda. I, I, wa- I, with you, I was watching the broadcast and she said that, and I was waiting for after the Panda, you know, her to be like the Panda number 48 pop. Yeah. Just like you. And, and that was it. She just stopped there and it was yeah. kind of like, okay. All right. Now batting Eric. <laughs> right. Okay. And it's it like, like, what? It was that was kind of like, all right, we're doing this and let's do it. And, you know, two pitches later, he grounded out and it was over. Well, she's never so, said that before. Like, no, it was weird. Yeah, I think she was going for, you know, oh, this is his last at bat. So I'm just going to call him by his nickname. I think it was just a miscalculation by her, to be honest. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. whatever. It is what it is. You know, it didn't change the outcome of the at bat. So. Really sad, but he's going to be uh, having Tommy John surgery, and you know he's not going to be ready for whatever around nine months or so. So well into June next year, he's not going to be in spring training with any team, and so that's what really affects his future because you know the Giants aren't going to sign him in the spring. No one's going to sign him in the spring. I don't think. Um, I think it's going to be trying to prove that he can come back from this surgery, and then he might be picked up by someone, but. This is the Zaidi era, Eric, and he is not – if this was, you know, the previous regime, I think Panda might have been picked up in June or July. I right. don't think Zaidi is going to sign him. I'm pretty no. pretty much 99% sure that's not going to happen. Well, you, you did lay out the roadmap last week for uh, the possibility of him being the under-the-radar comeback to the Giants because nobody else wants him type yeah. signing. But uh, I'm under the belief an AL team will go after him for his bat yeah, uh, to be a DH. Not the Red Sox. Like <laughs> nope, probably not. That would be hilarious if they did. Wouldn't that be But, something? like, even the Orioles or somebody like that, I could see, you know, Tiger or something like that going after him just to have the bat. And the name still does draw people. You know, Panda, you can sell Panda merch merchandise crap like that yeah i don't but, i don't think that his career is over in the major leagues but i think it's um certainly in its twilight uh yes. he may have a swan song somewhere but that's about it totally no, great about that it's sad all right so um anyway that was the game in which um actually i should yeah no that was the game in which pilar hit his 20th home run Yep. And then Monday yesterday during Labor Day, they had a morning game. We couldn't record. We had stuff going on, but the uh, Giants lost three to one. Tyler Beatty didn't pitch horribly, but not great. But Adam Wainwright was in playoff mode, and the Giants lost three to one. They have three more games against the Cardinals. So one of six for the week, Eric. Not so good. So yeah, they looked bad yesterday. That. Wayne Wayno had them. They they couldn't barrel anything up yesterday uh yeah. wainwright had them off balance and bd just still can't finish yeah. that's his freaking problem is he just can't finish hitters or innings and he throws more pitches than he needs to and his other problem is is when he misses he misses over the plate he doesn't miss out of the zone and i mean i was shocked he only gave up a couple runs yesterday i thought he was going to get yeah. tagged for like five or six the way that game started All right, so who's hot and who's not since we recorded? Um, I'm going to let you take who's hot this week since I usually do. I'll take who's not. All right, right, well, Buster Posey is 6 for 16. I I can't recall an extra base hit amongst the – oh, I think he doubled once. Um, And he had a three-hit game over the last week. Bumgarner threw uh, seven innings of one earned run ball the other day, and that one earned run was a Machado home run. And I still don't know how the hell Machado hit that ball out. It was perfect on the black, knee high, outer part of the plate. So Bum like did not make a mistake. It seemed like all game long. Yeah. And uh, Machado, I don't know how the hell he got his hands around that. And then surprisingly, Brandon Bell, who we heard uh, Homer earlier, Homer twice over the past week, and was one of the Giants' most productive hitters at seven for twenty-one. 
but with two homers and five runs driven in. And I'll say this, uh, with Brandon Belt, it figures that he gets hot when the team falls out of the race. And I don't know, it just seems to happen every year. And I wouldn't be shocked if Belt stays hot for a couple more weeks and fattens his stats up before he you know, might tank again at the end of the season. But, yep, just goes to figure Brandon Belt gets hot when the team is out of it. Well, of course, why not? That's I'm not going to pull any punches there. That's just how it is. That's just how it is. <clears throat> All right, who's not? Uh, Shark, um, he's been there – most consistent pitcher since June 1st, a sub one point, well, no, sub two ERA, 1.99. But his last 10.1 innings pitched, he has a 6.1 ERA. D Rod, of course, five innings, five earned runs. Dickerson, one for his last 16. He has really been struggling lately. Yeah. And this is something we're not used to, but, you know, this, you know, these things happen. Crawford, oh, wait, he's back on the who's not list. This is interesting. He's there like all the time. Two for 18, and Kevin Pillar is four for his last 22. But you have to temper that with the fact that he was their Giants, or the Giants probably player of the month for August. And even though it wasn't a great month for the team, he still hit 340 with six home runs and 17 RBIs. And then Yaz was three for 15 this past week. So these are, you know, things that happen. But the whole team as a whole not been doing too well so transactions let's talk about that since last week on august 27th the giants placed uh trevor gotten on the 10 day injured list with a right elbow strain on the 27th they optioned avellino to the river cats uh on the same day they optioned or released i should say scooter uh on the 27th they selected the contract of tyler rogers from the river cats now he's the submariner He's like yeah. We, we didn't talk about Kent, him. What do you think about Kent that? Kent Culvey. I don't know. He's he's fun. So as a kid and as a teenager, and even now, like I go to my CrossFit gym and I we have these soft racquetballs, uh, not racquetballs. They're like lacrosse balls, but they're soft. And I throw them against the wood wall to warm up my arm. I love it. I, it's like part of my warm up. She's like. You know, our, our coach is like, get on the bike, do five minutes of this and stretch and this and that. And, and I do that most of the time. But half the time I grab a ball and I just throw. I throw against the wall and I feel and I throw and I feel and I throw and I feel and I throw. And I love it. It just feels good. It's reminiscent. It just warms up my body. I get my heart rate up and then I stretch and whatever. And um, I do a submarine throw a lot of the time. I love doing that as a kid. And I never actually threw like that or pitched like that in my rare occasions that I pitched. But I know how to pitch like that. And to see a professional, which is very rare, to, you know, scrape the mound almost with their knuckles, go in submarine to give the, the, the players a different look, I love it. I know there's yeah. not really many Cy Young Award winners that are uh, submariners, but... I love the different look, and I think it's actually a little bit less wear and tear in the arm. Not statistically speaking, just kind of, you know, anecdotally. But um, I love I love the fact that he's up in the major leagues. His twin brother is also in the major leagues as well. So uh, it's fun to see that kind of camaraderie happen. Yeah, his parents watched his twin brother lock down a save from Minnesota in Chicago and then looked up to see their other son warming up in the bullpen at Oracle for the, his first yeah. time ever. And uh, I, I, I actually – I toyed around with submarining. Uh, my first ever pitching experience, I submarined at age nine. I struck out eight, and I don't know why I didn't stick with that style because it seemed <laughs> to work. Because uh, it's loose. You could have been on the Giants. Eric, right, come on. I, that could be me. I mean, because he, he doesn't throw hard at all. It's just the angle no. and stuff like that that do it. Yep. Yeah. So, they, you know, they. I, I love watching Rodgers pitch. It's fun when he comes in. It's a shame when he gives up a run just kind of like, you know, oh, man, how do you do that to our kid brother? Because that's how he seems almost. And there are some famous ones. But like you said, they're not uh, – it's not an overly dominant uh, form of pitching. And, and that's why it's not done as much. The same day that uh, Tyler Rodgers came up, Joey Rickard reappeared from the San Francisco. Sacramento River Cats, uh, and that was the day that Mauricio Dubon was also called up. Uh, he did not make a start in his first game. Uh, he was in his helmet, ready to pinch hit in the ninth inning of his first game, but it took until his second game up the big leagues to make his first start. And then when they turned the page to September, 
Uh, the Giants activated Pablo, like we talked about. They brought Connor Menez. Uh, this is the last September that, that they can call. They can expand their roster up to the 40 man. Uh, next year, it's going to be a cap at 28. So, uh, weird. yeah, the Giants did take advantage. They called up. They 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 activated Pablo. That's when I figured they would do it. You know, they got the the hit for him exactly when I thought they would. Uh, Connor Menez, Aramis Garcia, Birch Smith. And Chris Shaw all came up on the 1st of September in that first round of call-ups. Uh, and then Kyle Bearclaw, who they had originally signed and then cut, and then he cleared waivers, and he stayed in the Giants organization with Sacramento. They called him up yesterday and Andrew Suarez yesterday from Sacramento. And Bearclaw actually got in the game yesterday. And it came out that he grew up a Giants fan. Uh, he was a Giants fan during the 0-2 World Series. So, uh Apparently, Bearclaw does share some uh, fan traits with those of us there rooting for the Giants. And you know, uh, th- those are the transactions. Now, they might call up a couple more people after the minor league season ends. That's what I was going to say is that uh, you can expand to 40 right now. The Giants did not. They don't need no. 40 right now. So uh, they're going to, you know, maybe they'll let the uh, the playoffs happen as they may in AAA. But. They don't need these guys right now, but I know that one thing, you're not going to see players pitch the rest of the year. Position players, I should say. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's done. It's not going to happen. Okay, so minor league report. The San Jose Giants clinched a wild card spot in the California League A ball, and it was interesting because I watched the video of that, and they, they went nuts. They went nuts. They were spraying champagne, doing the whole thing, and... I mean, don't get me wrong. If I was an A-ball, I'd be doing the same thing. But at the same time, you're like, uh, you're a single-A <laughs> ball. and yeah. You made a wild card, and you're like, you won the Major League World Series. But okay, that's cool. You know, but, you know, look, these guys, most of them are never going to make the Major Leagues. Most of them will not even make AAA. So this is where they're trying to, you know, celebrate where they can. And yeah, this to yeah absolutely. They're not so, the only ones. Yeah, well, you know what's funny? Yeah, is no, the I, Giants you, organization has actually done pretty well in the minor leagues this year. Well, that's what I was going to say. You talk about that. And I, I recall, I think we talked about it a couple weeks ago, that like last year they all had losing records. So maybe for San Jose it was a while. I, I'd have to really look up the numbers and see how long it's it been since been they were last in the playoffs. Yeah. yeah. Like Sacramento, they won their division in the Pacific Coast League, the AAA team, and that's the first time winning their division as a Giants affiliate. Yeah. Um, and it was funny because last weekend when Cueto was doing his rehab starts, one of them was for the division, and he didn't even know it. Um, <laughs> Not surprising. It was like I, six innings of shutout ball, by the way. Yeah, yeah he just yeah. didn't know that that's what they were doing. Augusta yeah. in the South Atlantic League, the Sally League, is single A ball. They won their division, uh, I believe the first half division. And Salem Kaiser, the Volcanoes in the Northwest League, they also made the playoffs. They I think they won their first half division in that league when they had, you know, the likes of Bart on their team, but they don't yeah. have that stuff anymore. Not so much. I don't think it was Bart this year. It might have been Bishop, but still. Uh, so, yeah, that's what, four teams at least. I, I, I was searching. There might be one of the Arizona League teams might have made their playoffs too, but it's a complete turnaround from last year. No, for sure. Uh, what else you got? Uh, this week in Giants history. Uh, since we were talking about home runs earlier, it got me uh, – you know, with Pilar hitting his 20th for the first time in a while, uh, I noticed that Barry Bonds, when I was looking at his stats, on September 5th, 2007, Bonds hit his 762nd and final home run in the first inning off of Ubaldo Jimenez at Coors Field. It was a two-run shot. Uh, Nate Cheerholz was on base, uh, and that was Barry Bonds' final home run in his career. So what is that, 12 years ago this week? Oh and the goodness. last – yeah, long. the last – Yep, and that's the last time a Giant hit 28 or more home runs in a season. And this is left up, and it's hit to left field and deep. Holiday going back. Mack is not going to get it. You know, Max complaining that a fan interfered. He's not going to get this call because he never leaped. It's a two-run home run for Bonds, and that's what I mean. you got to locate with him. He gets a feel. And that pitch was up. <laughs> It's interesting because that home run I watched live, and it was fairly anticlimactic in a sense. Yeah, of, it eked out. 
it eked out and the fan reached over the fence and there's still to this day a little bit of a question of like if he wasn't there would that have gone out or not whatever it doesn't matter it's one home run but there was just no pomp and circumstance it was in colorado and you just heard the colorado you know announcers they're like ah this is a home run by bonds and and that ended up being his final home run of his career 762 and it's like that's the home run record um you know i still think that he was robbed but i shouldn't say that because look i know that he did he took performance enhancing drugs so i can't feel sorry for the guy i can't but at the same time, how many other guys have done the same thing? Would he have continued even if he wasn't on the juice? How many more home runs do you give? You, you know, we have, we have skinny guys hitting 20 home runs a year now. So, you know, it's not like too much out of the uh, the realm of uh, possibility that he could have hit 20 the next year. So, and like you said, if he played a couple more years, maybe 800. But that's just not going to happen. It was just so time. weird. I mean, a month before, he breaks the record. There's pomp and circumstance, at least for us Giants fans. Then yeah. a month later, he whacks a meaningless first inning home run off of Ubaldo. And that's it. That's his that's whole it. career. That's his career. It is so weird to think about. Like, that was yeah. his 28th homer of the season. And like I said, no Giant has matched that since then. Yeah, 28 home is... runs, and no one signed him the next year. Oh, yeah. Right? It's because he sucks in baseball. No, of course not. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, come on. I, I should but bring like, up those, the, the, that, you know, that year's uh, home run totals. I'm sure he was in the top 20. Well, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I said it. The next year, the Giants' leader in home runs was Benji Molina with 16. Yeah. I mean, God. come on. All right, well, good stuff. So anyway, coming up, the Giants have three more in St. Louis starting tonight, or I shouldn't say starting tonight, continuing tonight. They lost yesterday in the Labor Day affair. Uh, and then three against the Dodgers. And like you said, the Giants have nothing but winning teams left, it seems like, except for the Pirates and the Marlins. So, um, you know, 8-17, and 17, the, rest of the season seems like a no-brainer, but... If they continue to lose three out of five, four out of five, they're not going to get there. They need eight more wins. That's it. But last year, they only won five in September. So, I don't know. I mean, what do you think? I mean, I'll give them one against the Cardinals, and I'll give them one against the Dodgers, and maybe they can eke out one of those other two against the Cardinals. But I'm not giving them much credit against the Dodgers. The Dodgers are a juggernaut again. So, Dodgers are no. so good. Yeah. Yeah, they, they really are. They're so far and above everybody else in the National League. It's it's not even close right now. No, it's not. But hopefully someone like the Nationals, who are just playing so good in terms of baseball right now, and the uh, Dodgers uh, relief staff seems to be struggling, it would be just fantastic to see the Dodgers lose um, in that first round with the Nats against maybe right now the Cubs. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they win that, and then the, you know the Nats or whomever face them, and then that happens. So that would be fantastic. I'd love. Yeah, it. and it's funny. I I see I see that scenario more likely than say the Cubs somehow winning the wild card game, because uh, I think the Cardinals and Cubs are going to have to fight for that division, and the loser will be whoever plays the Nats, and I think that loser is going to get beat the crap beat out of them by the Nats, and so we have to hope. And I'll become Nats fans. But the problem is the Nats have never won an NLDS. <laughs> Thank you, Giants. Anyway. Yep. Um, all right. So that'll do it for episode 178 of the TortureCast. You can follow us collectively at TortureCast. Like us on Facebook. You can follow us individually at Two Out Hits for Eric. That's with the number two, Two Out Hits. Myself at ChadK21. And, of course, collectively at TortureCast. That'll do it for episode 178. Eric, do you have anything else tonight or today? A boom. <laughs> See you next time. A big thank you to everybody for listening to the Torture Cast, the podcast by and for fans of the San Francisco Giants. Follow us on Twitter at TortureCast. You can also like us on Facebook or check out our blog at TortureCast.com. I also want to say thank you to Ashcon and Bailey for letting us use their song Feeling Like a Giant for our intro. 
For Ben Lee and Chad King, my name is Willie Dills saying we'll see you next time.